Hi, I'm in conversation with the head of the 15th Finance Commission. Uh, joining me now on ET now is uh, uh, Mr. N.K. Singh. So thanks uh, for, for joining us, speaking to us at ET. Now let me first begin by talking about, you know, growth is slackening and everybody is talking about uh, the quality of Indian data. For the Finance Commission, of course, is going to look at this issue very closely. How are you assessing the entire data credibility issue and what will you budget for in your own estimates uh, when you finally submit the report? So let me first address your questions in two parts. Uh, I'm happy to speak to ET now. Uh, first part relates to some of this da uh, data and statistics which is coming on growth trends and the impact this will have on the likely projections in the work of the 15th Finance Commission. First, I think there is an, a bit of an element of exaggeration, if I may say so, in projecting this downward uh, scenario uh, for the Indian economy. Not only because I think it's a very short-term blip and uh, that the long-term trends or the medium-term trends even continue to be quite robust. You go by every conceivable data, by uh, what international agencies have have given, look at the latest IMF and other data, which projects really a very robust rate of growth for the, for the fiscal year as a whole. Uh, as far as this present uh, little downward trip which is concerned, I think that you must attach enough importance to what I call leads and lags, uh, because this is the lagged effect right. of a lot of build up of surplus capacity in the system. And uh, the fact that it's winding that down is showing itself up with a lag in terms of, of the of the current data and statistics no. and also the uh, attribution to the fact that a very major structural transformation on the entire area of taxation has taken place and before you begin to see the upward curves on the revenues it is uh, it'll take a while so i think that if you begin to look and begin to normalize for leads and la lags you'll come to the conclusion that the medium-term growth trends continue to be very robust and that's something which is of great concern to us because what we are looking at is not quarter to quarter figure. Mm. What we are looking at, we will be looking at the five-year projections right. from, for 20 to 25 and that does not seem to be uh, altered in any downward direction so far. Right. You know, uh, on the other issue of quality of Indian data, do you think it's been blown out of proportion? Because in Mumbai, you did talk about how the Finance Commission will be reconciling with the data. When well, you're saying reconciling, because the Finance Commission, I mean, you know, the CSO, uh, many say, uh, is looking at the quality of the Indian data. They have a robust mechanism in place. The Finance Commission doesn't really have one. Well, let me put it this way to you. Uh, uh, t uh, just two brief comments, three. First of all, I think when I talked of data reconciliation in Mumbai, uh, I think that the newspaper has projected it as if that I was looking at this whole holistic controversy relating to the data. That's not the, the Finance Commission mandate. We were looking at that we get data from multiple sources. The RBI particularly I spoke in the context of state debt, is the repository of the debt data the CSO is another source, finance mm. ministry is another source. We get data from the states themselves. Mm. So there are multiple sources you are getting from the controller of uh, civil accounts, you get data. And we want to reconcile the variations which we see in terms of published data. Now this is something quite different, this reconciliation, than the other context. But I'll make one, two more brief comments on that other issue. Mm, first and foremost, let me say that uh, it is quite normal that the base year of the GDP was revised and mm. made more contemporary. Right. The methodology is basically quite sound. It is in accordance with the international benchmark and the international practice. Now the limited issue is the data in regard to the manufacturing sector and the credibility of what is being called the MCA 21. Right. So that's something which is being worked on separately and that's to some extent uh, this has been exaggerated out of proportion to question the credibility of the institutions themselves who have really uh, done great service to us. And final point is really that on the whole culture of improving the efficiency, the quality of data at multiple levels, at the state level, at the central level, that's an area which, uh, on which the department has made some presentation to us that they will require some additional financial support hmm. to be able to improve the, the quality uh, of, of data uh, in the medium term 
and that request certainly is receiving the sympathetic attention of the finance commission i mean you know that's 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 uh, uh, would be that would be music to the ears uh, for a lot of people but do you believe that for is instance uh, let me tell you that they would you believe that uh, i mean you know if you want the best quality data right. from the uh, cso they really are needing uh, uh, additional budgetary support uh, right. uh, and and so on and so forth and that they in the presentations which they made to us they made a fairly persuasive case and also improving the by the way the quality of data at the state level hmm. at the state level and we have visited 20 states out of 29 we find that the states really that there is very poor quality of data and data mechanism right so both at the at the national level and at the state level there is need to improve uh, the uh, data quality you, you know since you are saying there's a need to improve the data quality and uh, the presentation that uh, uh, you know the CSO has made to the Finance Commission will get sympathetic attention uh, from the Finance Commission in terms of resource allocation how much higher resource allocation could we see well you know uh, frankly speaking let me say this that considering the resource envelope we have uh, and will deal with in terms of the broader issues this isn't ch even chicken feed okay uh, would you say that perhaps there is also a need for a statistical audit of the entire data process because a lot of people a lot of uh, economists are talking about how indian data uh, has uh, uh, you know uh, there's no credibility for the indian but by the way you know that's uh, that's something which has come in this kind of a public domain hmm. or uh, somewhat if I may say so more recently, because if you look at long periods of time, the uh, institutions which are responsible for the entire data gathering mechanism mm. has had a lot of international credence. Mm. So I, I think that I'm somewhat surprised that this has become such a major dominant report and that inst credible institutions which exist in this country have really lost out on credibility. But I think that the, the broader picture is that it's on account of the paucity of resources uh, and in paucity of systems and accountabilities. That's something uh, which certainly deserves uh, um, a very sympathetic look. All right, let me shift focus then, uh, Mr. Singh, and talk about the other big issue. That, of course, uh, is uh, the fiscal profligacy. This election season, we have seen every political party making very Which election do you not? <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, but this this election season we're talking about, you know, at a time when uh, we were walking on the, the path of fiscal consolidation, all political parties are looking to woo voters. You're right when you're saying that, you know, every election season we do see similar promises. But we have seen every subsequent year in the last five years and even before uh, the government trying to walk the path of fiscal consolidation and the revenue stream not looking very upbeat. How are you looking at this issue? Uh, how, do you think the state fiscal deficit is in a better condition than uh, uh, you know, the center fiscal deficit? How is it really working and how are you so looking at it? It's a kind of a flip-flop story. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for quite a while, uh, I think that the media seemed to have focused on the fact that the central government was uh, on the path of fiscal consolidation, but that the fiscal space, mm -hmm. which was invocated by the center, was getting occupied increasingly by the states mm. and since we as a finance commission are expected to look uh, at the fiscal deficit and more than the fiscal deficit the debt mm. as the principal macroeconomic anchor at the overall uh, uh, general government of mm. the center and the states the recent discussions which you have had it appears that the if the central government stays on the course mm. of the three percent fiscal deficit and adheres to the fiscal uh, FRBM targets and seeks to really have its debt to GDP aligned close to what obligations it has taken upon itself, namely by 24, 25, mm. uh, central government debt to be in the region of around 40% or so, mm. and that the states remain in conformity with their own FRBM Act, because each state has enacted their own FRBM Act, they remain in conformity with the obligations which are contained in their own act, right. then for the general government, it looks as though we may not be too off the mark on the target of the debt to GDP 
25, 24, 25, which is the terminal year of my recommendation. Do you, do you see that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, the, the center, because everything is based on whether the center is going to walk the path of fiscal consolidation. This election season we have, as in other elections as well, uh, the center making uh, or, or the party is actually making very extravagant promises. How do you well, let me reconcile put it this with way. that? A uh, lot has been, uh, two or three comments. Uh, first of all, I think a lot is made, made out by the, uh, by the uh, waiver, don't, debt waivers and so on and so forth. Now, as far as central government is concerned, they haven't done any generic mm. debt waiver. This has mm. largely been state-led action. Right. Now, in actual practice, it's not the first or the last time, perhaps, that it has been done. By the time it, uh, the actual incidence travels down, it, there's a couple of fiscal years it takes. The incidence is not as high mm. as initial projections show, and that it has to be seen in the context of the overall picture. Uh, uh, by itself, it is not something which uh, can ruin uh, a, a, fiscal, a fiscal strategy. Your question is that, uh, second question of yours was that a lot of it is dependent on the central mm. government adhering to its own path of fiscal consolidation. I have every reason to believe that the central government will adhere to the committed path of fiscal consolidation. Why? Because if you recall, for instance, this government has been one of those which have been fairly stringent on the fiscal roadmap. I mean, it, the whole idea it was when this government came was to revive the FRBM commitment. Mm. It's this government which appointed a new FRBM committee, which I had the privilege of chairing. And, uh, and it, this, it is this government which enacted that by regarding debt, which the rest of the world has mm. much earlier as a principal macroeconomic anchor and the fiscal deficit an enabling operational mechanism right. for reaching that. It, so the commitment and adherence of the government which is currently in office to the path of fiscal rectitude has been, has been quite significant. As, and so far, uh, and immediately after the release of even right. the BJP's manifesto, you must have seen um, various statements made by the finance minister and others that there was no intention to really uh, embark on a path yeah. of fiscal profligacy. In fact, uh, curiously, even the Congress government's uh, manifesto has also uh, a section on, on adherence to path of, of fiscal consolidation. So I think there is, seems to be a general recognition that India's macroeconomic stability is something with which you cannot mm. play around with and that you cannot really get uh, growth sustained over a long period of time if you do not pursue policies which are uh, fiscally cautious and do not result in, in, in profligacy because the, the result of fiscal profligacy is multiple. It might show up in a mm -hmm. short-term uh, uh, growth rate, but immediately you more than pay the mm -hmm. consequence of it and it has many other, other negative implications as well. You know, let me talk about, uh, uh, you know, a related issue that was highlighted by uh, the RBI as well. And they've said loan waivers and income support uh, will be some of the key issues that could lead to slippages. Uh, how is the Finance Commission looking at the challenges uh, that, of course, uh, the states are uh, going ahead with? So let me put it this way to you. We have visited uh, 20 states out of 29 states. Each state has presented their own fiscal scenario to us. There is a very wide variation, Ruchi, as to be expected. For instance, there are some states which have serious problems of legacy debt, which has been described, mm. which are way out of line. I mean, it could be in the, uh, in the upper regions of 30% debt to GDP. There are other states which are tantalizingly close uh, to 20%. There are some which are below 20%. Mm. So what we have to really look at is two things. We are looking at aggregate debt of the states should by and large be in the conformity of the regions consistent with the FRBM. Second, that within the framework of this, we, if for each state based on data which we have, we will give a, a, a unique debt and a fiscal deficit target which is in some manner look to be that the direction is the right direction so that when it is all aggregated, the consolidated hmm. debt of the general government is what it would be in conformity with the FRBM targets. Right. You know, uh, sir, you also in the FRBM panel report suggested a need for a fiscal council. Within the finance ministry, there is a lot of opposition to it. Uh, will the finance commission look at this? What's your own view? Do you believe there is a need for a fiscal council, not just for the center, but also for states, so that they are able to adhere to the past of consolidation? You know, Ruchi, in a lighter vein, uh, if we do recommend a fiscal council, we will be the third finance commission 
to to and which to, is why I asked to, to recommend the need for a, a whiskey council, and it to to me directly it flows out of the recommendations of the my own FRB on committee report, which I, as I said I chair. So we will give serious thought to recommending for a fiscal council. But more importantly, I think that going beyond the fiscal council, the need of some kind of an enforcement mechanism mm. in which the debt of the central government can also be in some ways disciplined and uh, 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 conforms to uh, really the FRBM. Why? Because as far as states are concerned, mm. you already have a, a very big handle in, uh, in terms of 293.3. Exactly. And the, one of the terms of reference of, of this commission is for us to look at the conditions which would be reasonable to impose or for states to give permission under 293.3. And we'll certainly be addressing that. But if, when the states ask me, fine, what is the counterpart mechanism for the central government? Exactly. That's so an area uh, on which uh, we'll try to see what kind of recommendations we can make which will strengthen uh, the compliance, uh, not yeah, only for the states, no but for the central Because there is no regulation for the center, exactly. There is no regulation for the center. Center can just go and do whatever but they But there is one it regulation, is. namely the parliament. So at the end, all these laws, rules and regulations are as good and as effective as uh, the people of India through their voice in parliament can make or not make. True. Since we are talking about fiscal deficit, uh, the states are, uh, and there are reports which say that uh, after the Uday scheme, now the DISCOM debt is back to the pre Uday levels. How big a concern is it? It's a concern. Uh, it's a concern because the uh, entire raison d'etre of an Uday is that you can segregate the problems of stocks and flows. Mm -hmm. That if we took care of the stock, which is the stock of debt, which uh, namely the state government took on the liability themselves, cleaned up the books of the electricity boards mm -hmm. or the distribution companies, mm -hmm. enabling them to really undertake uh, operations uh, without this past legacy debt, mm. but based on the assumption that they conform to the templates which are inherent in Uday. They have, right. they have voluntarily signed uh, the templates of the, of the Uday, mm. which is to bring down transmission uh, or mm. uh, transmission mm -hmm. distribution losses, to have a billing cycle which is regular, to have a collection cycle which is regular, and to bring down the difference between the cost of power and the power which is realized. So, and these are the basic four templates of the Uday scheme. And I think that there is some glimmer of hope that the Ministry of Power in the presentation which they made to the Finance Commission would lead us to believe that uh, there is some glimmer of greater compliance. But there are issues, uh, right. for instance, like the whole regulatory framework for Uday. I mean, is there a regulatory capture? Sure. Uh, that's a fair. Absolutely. That uh, are the state regulators fixing tariffs, which uh, as timely as they should, and fixing tariffs which would be in conformity with the principles and the uh, economic rationale for doing so, mm. or are they uh, in uh, dereliction of the objective and spirit of the regulatory institutions themselves? So there are these issues, but I think that uh, we need to make progress in that. But right now, it is true that the two big elephants in the room as far as state finances are concerned is the hangover Ude and of course the liability of the seventh pay commission. Absolutely. In fact, uh, uh, you know, let me move away from uh, the issue of fiscal deficit and talk about the other, uh, uh, you know, big area that uh, the Finance Commission will be looking at and that is of course uh, the goods and services uh, tax and the GST council. Uh, GST really was uh, the first truly federal structure that we saw in a very long time. Uh, after this election, in an event, if regional parties get more seats, what does it mean for the future of the GST Council and the way the coordination will take place between the Finance Commission and the GST Council? Let me put this way to you that uh, uh, GST is certainly something which is of great concern to us, which is of great relevance to us, because the, in the behavior mm -hmm. of the uh, revenues for the states. All states which you have visited, mm. uh, earlier finance commissions would tell them that why the hell don't you increase your revenue substantially. Now the classic reply is we have, mm -hmm. everything is now controlled, controlled by the GST. Right. But of course, they are all members of the GST council and it's not a question of giving up the state sovereignty. It's a concept of pooled sovereignty mm. for larger public good. So, um, but anyway, I, I think that the uh, 
the policy makers are quite conscious that the GST rates, the exemption, the compliance regime all needs a substantial improvement. The recent GST numbers which have come are, uh, do give uh, some hope and optimism, but these have to be sustainable because the tax buoyancy figures from the indirect taxes is critically dependent right. uh, on the GST collections, critically influences the state revenues. Of course, for the central revenue, revenue it is critical. So this is an area which is which we will watch with great care because we would like to see revenue buoyancy projections on the indirect tax to be as robust as the figures that we have received on the direct taxes. And unless that happens and the overall revenue buoyancy is satisfactory, uh, the resources which the Finance Commission mm. will have uh, to be able to partially do the job on the vertical and the horizontal will be greatly stymied. So upon the success right. is the flexibility that the Commission has in being able to allocate high, higher revenues. Uh, you know, uh, since we are talking about goods and services tax, uh, the Center uh, and the GST Council uh, recently has seen a lot of cesses being, uh, uh, being levied. Is there a case uh, that cesses should also be made a part of the larger pool, the shared pool? Let me put you first, I haven't addressed that question of yours earlier, if I may do so, yeah. that any relationship between the, the Finance GST Commission and, and the GST Finance Council. Commission. Well, I have written to the Finance Minister that uh, there should be a mechanism which enables uh, more meaningful consultations between the GST Council and the Finance Commission. Both are constitutional bodies, right. but uh, we will, from the GST Council, a uh, consultation process, maybe through the Secretariat, or some mechanism which enables uh, each other uh, to keep the others aware and informed of the decision making process. I think that will contribute uh, to a healthier process of the Finance Commission being able to fully discharge its responsibility. Now on the CES, mm. which you asked the question, it is no brainer that every state uh, which we have visited have argued that uh, CES and surcharges have proliferated, uh, the incidence has increased, a larger part of the uh, revenues are kept outside the divisible pool mm. and this is a practice which they would like to end and they would like the Finance Commission to make recommendations to make it shareable. Uh, whatever be the merits of that, currently the Constitution keeps cess and surcharge out and unless there is a constitutional amendment except to bring out the case of the states, there is nothing uh, uh, more that we can do. Earlier Finance Commission had also focused on it, on rationalizing the total cess and surcharge and this is a direction which we will continue to pursue uh, and also more importantly to see greater congruence between the purpose of the cess mm -hmm. and the manner in which the realization from the cess is, is put to use. Right. So, and this is going to be my last question. You know, even uh, when uh, the 15th Finance Commission uh, uh, came into being, at that point of time, a lot of southern states had raised uh, concerns with regard to the terms of reference and the population census uh, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that was the benchmark that was looked at. Uh, after having met 20 states out of 29, have you been safely able to put those concerns to rest? Well, only my report will put those concerns hopefully at, at not, if not at rest, at ease. Uh, uh, but uh, population was one major issue mm -hmm. linked with the census figures which right. are being used. We have been asked to use the figures of 2011. This is not our choice and the terms of reference are not uh, crafted by us. They are crafted by the President, but the Constitution obliges us and makes it our duty Right. to address the those terms of reference which the President lays down. So we will be addressing all the terms of reference. But in the population, if you will have noticed, there is one particular thing which is saying, looking at measures mm. to incentivize states right. which have achieved greater uh, and improved demographic management. And this is something that the economists also had raised when they met you in uh, yes. Mumbai. Yes. So we will try to look and explore the avenues where both the needs of the population as it exists today, mm. uh, actually the, it should be really 2021, but uh, needs of population since we have been asked to look at 2011, mm. we will be only uh, using the 2011 census figures, but combine that with uh, other things like weightages, uh, the formula in regard to incentives, mm. balance equity and efficiency that whereas the needs of the existing population need to be met, it in no way should impair incentives 
for those states who have governed better, right. formed better, and done a more credible job on demographic management. When you're saying incent you're, you're open to the idea of incentivizing such states, what are we looking at? Are we looking at larger share of pool for them? Well, there are various mechanisms which we have. Uh, uh, so uh, one can look at sectorally, one can look at more specifically, one can look at it from the viewpoint of uh, uh, building an ingredient to the horizontal formula, uh, etc. I mean, there are options which the Commission has. Uh, and if you recall, the, the 14th Finance Commission, which had a, perhaps a greater flexibility in the wording of the terms of reference, hmm. used a mix of the two census data of uh, the earlier census data, 71, which right. they were asked to, with a bit of the 2011. So they did that. We don't have in the wording on, on that, that flexibility, but we will look at all creative, imaginative ways that the sense of grievance is, uh, I I I is in some ways allayed and that the misgivings look to be exaggerated. But there are other issues on other terms of reference. On those two, uh, many, many states have raised the issue that they are not our flagship program, they are the flagship program. Right. We will look at all these, but, because, but we are obliged not necessarily to accept, right. but obliged to address all the issues contained in the terms of reference. All right, on that note, many thanks for taking your time out and speaking to us at ED now. Thank you, Ruchi.